I'm Mr. Red. Hello, everyone. Sydney St. James. Today, I have a very special broadcast. And as I'm preparing in my broadcast room here to get ready to present this presentation, I have to tell you, there is the most darkest clouds coming in from the west over Lake Georgetown. And they're approaching. And pretty soon, I was thinking, well, I'd have to stop recording and uh, let the storm pass. But it is so amazing that I said, no, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my microphone. I'm going to raise the window and I'm going to walk over there. Because today we're going to be talking about the power of prayer. And when I say the power of prayer, I have two dear friends of mine. One is right here in Georgetown and another is over down in Corpus Christi. The one in Corpus Christi I've known since 1962. Dear, dear friend, lost touch with her for almost 50 years and we found each other. Went to church camp with me and actually she was uh, the sparkle in my eye when I was just turning 13. She has cancer. And so does my other friend. Well, today, before we begin the broadcast and how powerful prayer is, let me walk over to the window.
top of the day, everyone. This is Sydney St. James, your host, and I want to thank you again for being here with me as we talk about the power of prayer. Sometimes I think the most challenging part of being a Christian is acknowledging that there are many of our friends and family we hold deeply in our hearts who do not agree with the same convictions as we do. They don't recognize Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and they may not even acknowledge God. It might be parents or siblings, maybe even our children or nieces, nephews, even friends and neighbors. As a Christian, no matter who that person is, it causes me pain, anxiety, and fear. And I'm sure it does you too. However, let me preempt what I'll be talking about today with a bit of a story about how when I was younger, I was bulletproof. I didn't need to pray. Nothing could bother me. I was tough as I could be, right? To be honest, I have done more praying in my last 15 years than I did all the rest of my younger life. The answer is when you're younger, let's face it, our end wasn't even thought of. Maybe that's why we did so many crazy things that we would never do as an older person. Also, not as many friends and family have ailments and get sick or pass away as they do when you get older. Besides, I did so many things back then that I won't tell you where back then was, but I will give you a few examples. You know, I tempted death in so many, many ways, I guess you could say. And I guess I did that because down deep in my mind, I was bulletproof. Once, with my shotgun in hand, I got on my belly and I crawled into a rice field canal that was beginning to let the water out of the rice fields. It was early September. Guess what? Numerous large cottonmouth water moccasins called that ditch their home. But still, I got on my belly and I crawled to sneak up to some plump and good-eating geese who were just on the other side of the embankment. They had excellent eyesight, but poor hearing. So, I stayed low. So, in other words, when I ran into a snake, it was definitely eye to eye. Can you imagine? Can you get down on your belly and your mind for just a moment and start climbing through the mud and the weeds and all of a sudden in front of you, there's a roadblock. A big black cottonmouth water moccasin. Oh, only God knows I would not do that today. Not even for a million dollars. Or take me restoring my old 1954 Ford and driving out FM Road 102 from Eagle Lake to Columbus to see my girlfriend. And at that time, I decided it would be cool to double the speed limit signs on the curves on that farm to market road. It was something we did with our cars other than run the quarter mile marked off out past Senior Bridge. On one such occasion, I didn't make it. Nope. Oh, Beulah, that's what I called my car, would never be the same. But I came out of all of that without a scratch. Oh, those younger days when nothing could possibly hurt us, we all remember it. Or doing crazy things like sitting in Randy's nightclub out on Westheimer Boulevard, West Houston, and stacking shot glasses from tequila shots three or four levels high. 
crazy, right? And then on top of that, driving home, huh, never, never today would I even give it a single thought. I'm still here, and again, only God knows why. But today, my friends, my family and good friends all around me need a prayer, a prayer of support. The list is so long. Knee replacement surgery, cancer, heart attack, blood clots in the brain, dementia. Oh, the list just simply goes on and on. So nowadays, keeping so many loved ones in our prayers daily gets more challenging to keep up with. Thank goodness we have Facebook, making it easier to stay in touch a dear friend, as I mentioned in the early part of the broadcast, has cancer right down in Corpus Christi, Texas. One that I've known since the eighth grade. It is wonderful that I give words of comfort daily on Facebook to her. Plus, as I have gotten more years under my belt, I have learned more about the magnificence and the true power of prayer and today, I'm about to tell you what I've learned. Thanks for joining me. As a father, a grandfather, and godfather to many little ones, many people do in fact, in my life, do fit into the non-Christian type. This, my friends, causes me so much pain, as I've said, but mostly, it makes me very fearful. I know exactly where I will be when I leave this life, and that thought gives me great pleasure. It really does, but I also know it's only by the grace of God and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that I've been given that opportunity. It was handed to me as a choice, and I took it. I chose it. I also know that on that big day of judgment, every knee in this world shall bow, and every tongue will confess. In the book of Isaiah, 45 verses 22 to 23, it says this, Turn to me, be saved, for I'm God, and there's no other, no other whatsoever. I have sworn that my mouth has spoken in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. And he says, Before me, every single knee will bow. By me, every tongue will swear. And it's said in another way. If you turn to Philippians 2, 10 through 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In heaven and on earth, under the earth, every tongue acknowledges that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I was out to dinner with one of my best friends and speaking to her just the other day, she mentioned she was very concerned that a loved one turned away from God in his later years because he didn't understand why he would take him at such an early age. When I read the scriptures, I saw the one she held so dear with a hand on the back of his neck forced to kneel and bow down, unwilling, even at that moment in his life, to believe in Jesus Christ. My heart broke while listening to that story, and I know it also saddens the heart of our Father in Heaven that it has to be done. But will we all stand there and watch in horror? Would we be emitting cries of anguish as those we've loved and cherished on this earth 
will be turned away? It's the kind of vision that plunks me down on my knees sometimes and leads me to a call of prayer. Maybe that's a beautiful thing that I see that. That I sense that now while I'm still right here in this big world of ours, let me tell you, my lifelong godfather lived until he was almost 99. He was part of my life from day one. For the last few years, he experienced dementia. Until that time, he prayed that God would take him home. His family and my wife and I all said God needed him here to pray with all of us. And pray he constantly did without ceasing. Although I often wonder if he still prayed in his years during dementia, I believe that sense was so firmly seated within his spirit that he did. I know his prayers helped lead me to where I am now, today. In Ezekiel 22, verse 30, it says, I looked around for a man among them who would build a wall and stand the gap before me for the land so that I wouldn't destroy it. But I didn't find anyone, no one, not one single person. Was I called to be that person and I went and ignored that call? Did I choose to just turn away and not see someone destined for death? Was I too discomfited, too cowardly, too afraid of offending them? That thought actually makes me cry. And it also grips me with great fear. We are all called to stand in the gap, intercede for people, and pray for them. I believe without one single doubt, we are called to do just that. The scriptures, they give me comfort. I know without any possible reservation that prayer is resilient. It is a very powerful thing. Whatever it is that you might ask in my name, God said, this I'll do that the Father is glorified in the Son. If you ask me absolutely anything in my name, I will do it. That came from John 14, verses 13 through 14. And what do I say about that? Wow, <laughs> right? When reading that scripture, I lean back in my chair and ask, do I have that kind of faith? I pray to God that I do, and I also pray that I can help change the lives of those I love, and maybe, just maybe, those we especially do not like but need our prayers. Or maybe it's someone we've never even met before, or we'll never meet. Until that one day in eternity, someone will walk up to us and say, you don't know me, but do you remember? We must be open to all opportunities to pray. When I was in the third decade of my life, a very close friend and sister in Christ loved to go digging in the trash dumpsters with me in Southwest Houston in Sharpstown. My wife thought we were crazy when we both disappeared in one of those on the day that she and I took our engagement photos. I still remember my good friend. Her name is Georgie, and she started shouting with joy while we looked into a dumpster just off of Harwin Boulevard 
near SASCOM Delta Geophysical Processing Center in Southwest Houston. She had spotted a large pack of Hallmark greeting cards. They had been tossed away by someone living in nearby apartments and they were all written by the same person. My friend loves to repurpose cards and excitedly put them in her satchel to save them from their downfall. Her heart was impressed by the written phrases in each of the cards. It was placed in her heart to pray for the person who had written them. Was this mystery person currently a Christian? My friend had no clue and knew nothing about the person except her first name was Geraldine. But wait, God knows who Geraldine is. Yes, indeed, he does. And knows she needed my good friend to pray for her. How cool is that, right? Every Sunday, at the conclusion of services in our church services at Old Bethany Cumberland Presbyterian Church near Cushada, Louisiana, the Reverend Adas Caston Slayton Bonds would leave the whole congregation in the singing of the chorus of the hymn, Lead Me, Lord. To do it. Now, does that mean that we go stand on a street corner in downtown Eagle Lake and shout the gospel out, echoing off all the buildings in this small community? How upright it would be if that were effective. 
but we know it usually isn't. Past experience in life has certainly taught me I can sermonize and talk until I'm blue in the face. I know my words fall on top of deaf ears. In fact, if I continue, it will not be heard. However, those I'm trying to sway will only be stronger in their beliefs against God and against Jesus Christ. So, in my opinion, there's a time to speak, to speak out, and then there's a time to be silent. Therefore, I'm left only with prayer and showing how I go out and live my life each and every day. Hoping I will let the radiance of Christ to shine through me through my podcast, not my actual going out and preaching. So that leaves me with three things that I need to do. If the word has been given, it's there. May only be a tiny seedling, but that tiny little seed can be nurtured and cultivated. Not by me. That's up to God, our Father in heaven. It's incredible how God set my course late in my life, but he has at just the right moment and at just the right place. I absolutely love studying each and every word of God and presenting my weekly Christian podcast on this show. That's one thing. Second, give my dear friend and loved one over to God. For me, this is the most challenging part because I must leave these non-believers in his hands and ask for whatever it possibly takes to soften up their hearts, to open their eyes, to free up their minds, realizing that might not be a pretty sight to behold, but I need to have faith. We all need to have faith. God knows the plans. We must pray into his plans. And the third action is to ask. God knows what's in our hearts, but the big man upstairs, he wants us to ask for it. Pray without ever stopping. This is where I need to emphasize something. Pray and trust. Bow your head and trust. Then look up to the heavens and trust. That's all we can do. And as a Christian, that's what we must do. It's our duty. I know God hears my prayers, and I also know He responds to them. I only need to be patient and wait. Sometimes I don't really have patience, but I do, (laughs) if you know what I mean. I might not live to see the answers, because his timing is definitely not my timing. But I do know, I truly know that prayer will be answered. In Peter 3, 9, he says, the Lord isn't being slow about his promise, as some people might think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to be obliterated, but wants everyone to repent. My wife and I pray every day at the dinner table. We pray for specific people and specific results with hopes of bringing that person to Christ. We're not always in the same place, but I know we're praying together. When God puts something or someone in our heart, don't turn it away. Find someone to pray with, someone who knows the person and the situation they're in. Ask them, just go and ask them to pray with you. It's good to set a specific day and time that works for both of you 
And then, just do it. Hmm, that's a commercial slogan I see on t-shirts and socks nowadays. <laughs> just do it. That time for my wife and me, it's at our noonday meal. Then, then go and watch God at work. There is a remarkable amount of power in prayer. But for now, up a quick message from my sponsor. I hate to do it, but I've always got to get my sponsor in here somewhere because he helps me keep the lights on. So be right back with the rest of my story. Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep, Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And now for the rest of my story. As most of you are aware, I love to write. After 50 novels, I've laid down my pen for a while and talked about so much that I learned in writing those books, especially in the series called The Faith Chronicles. So, you know in my podcast, I like to tell stories. After all, I'm Sidney St. James, right? Writer of novels and teller of stories. So today is no different. Let my story begin. It began when I was living near Sharpstown off of Fondren Boulevard in Houston, Texas during my younger life. I'd just gotten out of college and got my first apartment in real life, a place known as the Spanish Trace Apartments. One day, I went over to the mailboxes and had some mail or should I say, one envelope. I was so excited, because I never got any mail of my own. I thought maybe it was my girlfriend from Columbus, and I was all excited. It was a letter, just not from her. It was from a car dealership just a few blocks up the road towards the Southwest Freeway. It was exciting because no one knew me as I had just moved there after graduating from A&M. It wasn't from anyone I knew, but there was something hard taped to the inside. Hmm. I quickly opened it up, tore the paper, and looked at what was inside, and there was a gold key. Yes, sir. And it looked like a car key. Now, it wasn't 24 karat gold, but the color gold. But in either case, being young, right out of college, hardly a nickel to my name, that key looked real, and I was going to keep reading what was in that envelope. But first, let me, let me ask you a question, my listener. Have you ever received a shiny key in the mailbox attached to a letter or on the outside of an envelope? I bet somewhere in your life you have. Back then, it was common, especially if an advertiser was trying to get you to come in and visit. Of course, there was no internet or Amazon or anything online. However, back then, the now and with it deal was car dealerships sometimes would mail out thousands upon thousands of keys to people to try and entice them into their dealership. Remember, before the internet, this was the only way to attract someone to your business. They said in the letter that I read that the key I was holding might actually start 
a brand new car. And if it did, in fact, I would get to keep it. I would win. Huh, gosh, here I was, fresh out of college, living from paycheck to paycheck with a mud-covered old Ford Maverick from trips to the rice fields that was definitely on its last leg. I was sure looking forward to it being a new Corvette, but come to find out, it was a dark blue Malibu. The kind that Gene Epps once drove in Eagle Lake, Texas on a quarter mile back during the British invasion. Music, that is. But hey, gosh, beggars can't be choosy, right? So I called the office, said I'd be in late, and I took off and I headed for that dealership right away. I sat out in the parking lot for 10 minutes until they opened at nine. I waited and waited for those doors to open. Then, finally, I opened the letter again and it said, if I drive up to the dealership, sit in the beautiful Malibu, put my key in and turn that ignition, and it was to start, the key I received in the mail had just gotten me a brand new Malibu. This story sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? How many of you have won a brand new car by simply receiving the right key in the mail? Anyhow, if it didn't start, my key wasn't even worth the postage price it took for the dealership to mail it to me. If that was true, I might just throw it away in the trash bin as I was walking out the door. Guess what? Prayer? Prayer is like that key that I got in the mail. Amazing things can happen when the correct key is for the right automobile, right? After all, I am praying to God who made and owns everything, right? But there were way too many people who don't know how to use this key. And so, they don't feel like prayer actually works for them. So they laugh when they receive it, and they just simply throw it away in the trash can. Whoa! Now wait one second. Maybe, just maybe, those people stuck it in the wrong ignition and not the right car. Or they tried to open the door number one, or door number two, or door number three with it or a book locker at school since nothing happened. They presumed it was like one of those keys at the auto dealership that wasn't worth much more than the postage that was stuck on the envelope. But God Almighty gave us the secret to the power of prayer. And he made it quite simple and quite plain. The secret to having this key that I'm talking about today to actually work is Jesus Christ. He, my friends and neighbors, is the ignition that this key must fit in order for it to work. Listen to what the man upstairs has to say about it. If you make yourself at home with me, and my words are at home in your heart, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. If you'd like to look up the words, they're found in John 15, verse 7. And just in case you didn't quite understand what he was saying in that verse, try this one. From now on, Whatever you request along the lines of who I am and what I'm doing, I'll do it. That's how God will be seen for who he is in the Son, Jesus Christ. I mean it. Whatever you ask for in this way, I will do. That's in John 14, verse 13. He truly means it. Whatever it is that you ask for along the lines of who Jesus Christ is and what he's doing, 
he will do it. So, back to the secret of gaining access to the power of this kingdom key isn't the number of minutes you spend praying every day. It's not even if you pray with your eyes open or shut, or you're staring up at the ceiling, or you're looking down into your lap with your head bowed. It's not how often you toss in spiritually sounding words like Father in Heaven or Oh Great God. Instead, the secret to retrieving the power of prayer is in hanging out with Jesus Christ like he's one of the boys. Let him what he says out within your heart and ask him for things he wishes for you to do, to have, to be, and to become. In one of my earlier broadcasts, do you remember that my grandmother's favorite gospel hymn was one called, I want to be like Jesus in my heart? The secret, my dear listeners, is where you put this key to the kingdom, or put it in the heavenly ignition of Jesus Christ and what he's doing where he's going and what he wants you to do. And then bingo! Run, 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 run. You are the winner. He will open the door and he will send the rain and he will part the sea. Much like Moses did in the Ten Commandments with Joel Brenner. God will show you your way. Recently, I joined a group of dear friends at a Mexican restaurant in Georgetown, Texas, where we get together once a month. One day, another good friend was going through radiation treatments and was not at the gathering. At the beginning of the meeting, a good friend at the table said, let's pray before we start our supper. Sydney, you say the prayer. You must understand it was a very packed restaurant with someone sitting at all of the tables around us. The first time, I suppose I was really caught off guard. We all were, were, but I am obedient to whatever the Holy Spirit had commanded by my friend to ask of me didn't say a word. So, I started praying for our good friend and thanking God for the opportunity to pray together. Afterward, I found out another colleague was so moved by us praying together that he teared up and left the table for a moment. I wondered who else felt similarly. When God uses prayer in this way, it often moves us so profoundly that it brings water to our eyes. It requests us to call upon Him and, in doing so, renews our spirit. Nonetheless, many of us possess memories of comparable experiences where the Holy Ghost really tends to move us. Now that we mean we are always persuaded to pray when we need to, have you ever felt desperate for prayer but chose not to pray? Possibly God put someone in your life in that one particular moment that said, let us pray. I'm sure we all have friends and loved ones that we don't know, but who need us to pray for them. It works. Together, the power of prayer is so mighty. A couple of months ago, I was driving with my wife and telling her how I struggle with finding forgiveness and giving and receiving it. It is a continuing conversation that came from my book, Faith, 70 times 7. At that very moment, 
she spoke. Let us, let us pray about it, honey. I collected my thoughts and I said, why don't I always do that when I am reminded of this way I feel completely separated from God? That's just one of the many times someone out of the blue has unexpectedly said this to me lately. And I'm continually moved by how God uses that itty bitty call to action from friends and loved ones to show me just how much I need him to show me the real power of prayer. Let me close today by saying that it never fails when I pray with others. My spirit feels renewed, renewed tenfold. It is such a wonderful feeling. Well, I gotta go. And as usual, be sure to go up to the right-hand side of the web page when you signed into this broadcast. And there's a blue tab that says, leave a voicemail. Your voicemail comments are greatly accepted and greatly appreciated. And if they deal with this or any of the other shows, I will begin on one of my next episodes highlighting some of these voicemail comments from you, my friends and listeners from around the globe. If you're bashful, a few kind words in a review, or even share this podcast with a friend is appreciated. Until then, as always, see you later, alligator. That does it for another episode on the Sydney St. James Show. I want to thank everyone for listening and everyone for dropping by today. Also, I'd like to ask you, if you haven't already done so, be sure to click the follow button. Leave a short review with maybe, hmm, kind words and tell your friends about the Sydney St. James Show and share the, share the show with anyone that you think might like the show. The more, the merrier, and maybe by the end of this year, our goal is to have 100,000 listeners for the Sydney St. James Show, and I want you part of that listening group. Until the next great episode from the Sydney St. James Show, again, thank you very much from me, Sydney St. James.